commonly used anti-epileptic drugs as outlined by neurologist Peter Morrison. My name is Peter Morrison. I'm a child neurologist at Maine Medical Center with an interest in pediatric epilepsy. Today we're going to give an overview of anticonvulsant medications. So in general I'll go through each of the commonly used anticonvulsant medications and try to describe them as either narrow spectrum used primarily for partial seizures or broad spectrum. Comment on some general impressions of the medication and how I use it. Uh, also comment on some common or concerning side effects. And then also if there are any pediatric friendly dose formulations, uh, I'll mention that as well. So phenobarbital is the first medication we'll talk about. It's been around for a long time and because of its long record of efficacy and safety uh, is frequently used in younger children. There are certainly a number of concerning side effects. Uh, sometimes sedation and cognitive clouding. Uh, hyperactivity can also be seen in kids. Uh, in terms of long-term use of phenobarbital, there's been uh, some suggestion that it can adversely affect IQ. It comes in a variety of uh, different tablet sizes and also comes as a liquid, which is relatively easy to administer. Dilantin, again, a medication that's been around for a long time, primarily useful for partial seizures. Uh, it's in general thought of as effective, uh, low cost, one of the main problems is the erratic absorption in children, and it's difficult to maintain adequate serum levels without underdosing or overdosing, and for that reason I rarely use it in children. Uh, valproic acid or Depakote is a broad spectrum agent. Uh, it's thought of as a very effective medication, particularly for the generalized epilepsy syndromes. There are some rare but concerning organ toxicities, and uh, for reasons I'll get into, it's not a first-line agent for young women. Side effects include tremor and weight gain, both of which are common. It can also cause polycystic ovary syndrome, platelet abnormalities. Uh, there are rare but serious organ toxicities including liver failure and pancreatitis. In terms of use in young women, particularly of childbearing age, Depakote has clearly been shown to increase the rate of fetal major malformations. And for that reason, it's not a medication that I use as a first-line agent. In terms of pediatric friendly formulations, it comes as sprinkle caps, which can be sprinkled in applesauce or yogurt or whatever someone may prefer. Uh, it also comes as a liquid. Uh, unfortunately, the liquid needs to be given three times a day. Carbamazepine or Tegretol is another first-generation anticonvulsant. This is a narrow-spectrum agent useful for partial seizures, and this is important as it can make generalized seizures worse. In general, it's thought to be an effective medication. It has fewer cognitive side effects than the barbiturates. Uh, however, it is an enzyme-inducing agent, so it can interfere with the metabolism of other medications and may also have adverse effects on bone health. Children can also, if you're tired, tired on the medication, have ataxia or double vision. So those were the major first-generation anticonvulsants. There's a number of medications that have come out since 1993, which I have listed on the slide here. We'll go through many of these medications and try to highlight how they're used and some concerning side effects. Lamictal or Lamotrigine is a broad-spectrum agent. It's useful for a variety of seizure types and can also be used in childhood absence epilepsy. In general, we think of it as a good broad-spectrum agent. It may be a good alternative to Depakote in the generalized epilepsies, particularly in young women. In general, it has a relatively clean cognitive profile and seems to be tolerated well. In terms of side effects, the major side effect that we worry about is rash, which can sometimes progress to Stevens-Johnson syndrome. The rash seems to be more likely when this is started quickly or added to valproate. And so the one downside of Lamictal is we typically need to start in small doses and slowly increase over a period of six weeks or so. However, aside from that limitation, it's a well-tolerated medication that's useful in a lot of different types of epilepsies, and it comes as a chewable formulation, which can be kid-friendly. So Pyramid or Topamax is another broad-spectrum agent, again, thought of as an effective anticonvulsant medication, although with occasionally concerning cognitive side effects with word-finding difficulties and language problems. Other side effects include kidney stones, sometimes weight loss. It can also be effective for migraines and so can be useful in patients who are either obese or who have comorbid migraine headaches. It also comes as a sprinkle formulation which can be sprinkled on foods. Oxcarbazepine or trileptal is a narrow spectrum agent useful in partial seizures and again can make generalized epilepsies worse. In general it shares some properties with carbamazepine but tends to be better tolerated. Side effects include hyponatremia, rash, diplopia, dizziness. It comes as a liquid which can be easily administered. Levetiracetam or Keppra is another second generation anticonvulsant that is being used frequently. 
It's a broad spectrum agent useful for both general and partial seizures. Uh, in general, it's well tolerated. There are no organ specific toxicities or drug drug interactions, uh, which makes it an easy drug to use. One concerning side effect are behavioral side effects. Perhaps 10 to 20 percent of children will become agitated and sometimes, frankly, aggressive, uh, which can uh, require discontinuing the medication. Overall, however, it tends to be well tolerated and comes as a, uh, a liquid formulation which is pediatric friendly. Zanisamide or Zonagran is another broad spectrum agent. It's loosely thought of as related to Topamax, but perhaps with fewer cognitive side effects. It's effective for a variety of seizure types. It shares some similar side effects to Topamax, including appetite suppression, weight loss, and kidney stones. Now, there are three medications that just came out in 2009, and we'll review those quickly here. One is called Lecosamide, uh, marketed under the name Vimpat. It's not clear if this is a narrow or broad spectrum agent. Most of the early trials have been done as add-on therapy in patients with partial seizures, so we loosely think of this as a partial agent, although we still have, obviously, a fair amount to learn about it. Side effects include dizziness, headache, nausea, and double vision. But this can be an effective medication in patients with medically refractory epilepsy. Rafinamide, or Banzel, is a broad spectrum agent. Again, this is a newer agent which just came out in 2009. There have been some specific pediatric studies looking at refractory seizures in Lennox-Gastaut syndrome, and it seems to be particularly effective for this syndrome, which is often characterized by difficult to control seizures. And this is one place where this is useful. And generally, it's well tolerated. If started quickly, can cause some somnolence or vomiting. Vigabatrin or Sabril was a medication recently approved for use in the United States, although it's been used in the UK for some time. It's a medication primarily used for infantile spasms. It can also be used for refractory partial epilepsy. The main concern regarding Vigabatrin is retinal toxicity, which can lead to permanent peripheral visual field loss uh, and even blindness. For this reason, there's extensive paperwork that needs to be done when using this medication, and all children need to be followed by ophthalmology. The most important factor when deciding on a medication is to accurately identify seizure type and epilepsy syndrome. And the reason for this is that generalized seizures can be made worse by the narrow spectrum agents. In terms of efficacy, there isn't really any compelling data that one medication is necessarily more effective or better than another, although there are some caveats to this. Another important consideration in anticonvulsant selection is side effects. For instance, if a child's having behavioral problems, I would tend to avoid Keppra or Levetiracetam. However, if there are concerns regarding drug-drug interactions, for instance, if a child's on a chemotherapeutic agent, then Keppra or Levetiracetam may be a good choice. If someone's overweight or female, I would avoid Depakote. If there's concomitant migraine, I would consider Topamax or Topiramate or Depakote, both of which are effective for migraine prevention. If someone's underweight, I would avoid Topamax or Topiramate as it can cause weight loss. If there's a concomitant mood disorder, I would consider Lamotrigine or Valproate as they've both been used as mood stabilizing agents. In general, while we know some common side effects, side effects of these medications can be unpredictable. Some are dose dependent, other side effects seem to occur regardless of dose. In general, the newer medications tend to be better tolerated and have a better cognitive profile. The long-term effects of these medications is still unclear. There are a couple other important considerations when using anticonvulsant medications. One that's come up recently is suicidality, and the FDA has required a black box warning on all anticonvulsant medications. The reason for this is looking at uh, all the clinical trials that have been done, those patients on anticonvulsant medications have a higher rate of suicidal thoughts or behaviors. This rate overall is very small, but it's still important to be aware of. There's some controversy regarding the use of brand name versus generic medications. It's important to remember that the active ingredient is identical and serum levels are often equivalent. And so in general, it's permissible to use generic substitutions. There are some patients, however, that are exquisitely sensitive to medication changes and levels, and so brand name may be preferred. In conclusion, anticonvulsant medications are typically well tolerated and effective. Unfortunately, there are still about a third of patients whose seizures are not well controlled with medications. For these patients, other options should be considered. These include epilepsy surgery, therapeutic diets, and neurostimulation, which we cover in another webinar.